In this video, I show you the MR anatomy of the plantar plate of the lesser metatarsophalangeal joints and how you can identify plantar plate tears. That is, if I'm not losing my voice during the video. So I'm not going to cover the plantar plate of the great toe. I will do a separate video in the future about that. Before we start with the MR anatomy, we first have to understand the concept of the plantar plate and its ligaments shown here in this uh, lesser metatarsal joint here we have the plantar plate made of fibrocartilage here in green and then we have the proper collateral ligament which is um, this structure here and we have an additional accessory collateral ligament which is originating from the metatarsal head and then inserting into the plantar plate if you change your view on this joint it looks like this. We have the plantar plate here spanning from the metatarsal head to the base of the proximal phalanx. And then you have the accessory collateral ligament coming down here, inserting into the plantar plate. And the most upper portion here is the proper collateral ligament. Now, if you do a cross section here about at this level, it looks like this. We have the plantar plate here. We have the accessory collateral ligament here in blue and then again the proper collateral ligament. So you can appreciate the plantar plate and these collateral ligaments, the accessory one and the proper one. Mm. The best sequences to assess the plantar plate of the lesser metatarsal joints are sagittal views and axial views of the forefoot. You can see here at the level of the metatarsal head there is a black structure or low signal intensity structure here between the flexor tendons and the metatarsal head. This is the plantar plate. And on this axial view, you have this U-shaped form here that I have shown you in the diagram earlier in this video. And you have the plantar plate here. And these black structures on both sides are your accessory collateral ligaments. And the most upper portion is then the proper collateral ligament. Now let me scroll through here from the proximal to the distal aspect of the joint. Here are the fascia bands. Then we have the plantar plate with the accessory collateral ligaments. These accessory collateral ligaments do not insert into the base of the proximal phalanx, but they insert into the plantar plate. So it's this structure here. And what you can see up here, then inserting into the base of the proximal phalanx is the proper collateral ligament. On your sagittal view, this is the plantar plate. But keep in mind that below the plantar plate you have the flexor tendons. So it's not the whole thickness here that is the plantar plate, but it's this is the flexor tendon running just adjacent to it, and this is the plantar plate. The proximal origin or insertion is typically ill-defined. You might find some little recesses here as well. And if you don't see the black structure attaching into the bone here, do not mistake this as a tear because this is a very unusual site that the tear would occur anyways. Then the insertion of the plantar plate onto the base of the proximal phalanx, you can have some slight signal hyperintensity here. Like in this case, this is still completely normal. This is a different patient and you can see the plantar plate again nicely here as a black structure between the flexor tendons here and the metatarsal head. Note that this time the plantar plate in this mid-sagittal view of the joint is not attaching into the base of the proximal phalanx, but we have some very bright signal intensity, like a fluid signal intensity here, entering into the plate or into the insertion. And this is still considered to be a normal finding, especially if it's at the mid portion of the joint and this is referred to as the mid sagittal recess or mid sagittal cleft and if you measure this distance and it's less than 2.5 millimeters it's considered to be a normal finding and not reflect a plantar plate tear in this case it's about one millimeter wide note that these recesses are present in around 47% of all MTP joints according to studies. Again, this is a different patient and we are at the level of the second metatarsophalangeal joint. And let's go to the mid-sagittal portion of the joint. It's about here. And you can see the plantar plate here at this thin black structure. 
and this is the flexor tendon running just adjacent to it and this is the metatarsal head and there is still some cartilage here. Then we have this slight hyperintensity, these proposed uh, signal changes that are still considered to be normal and if it's that bright it might even reflect a mid-sagittal recess or cleft in this case and it's about two millimeters wide. Now if you go from the mid-sagittal portion of the joint to the lateral or medial side then this recess should go away and you should have the plantar plate inserting into the base here like this. If we go through the other side you can also see that the structures are nicely attaching to the bone. And here again on your transverse or axial view you can appreciate the plantar plate, the flexor tendons and the accessory collateral ligaments here and the proper collateral ligaments here. And if we go from proximal to distal then you can see here there is like a hole and this would basically reflect this recess. Before I show you some cases with plantar plate tears, why do we even care about the plantar plate at all? Well, first of all, it's a very important stabilizer of the lesser metatarsophalangeal joints. If you have a plantar plate tear or a complete tear, you can actually have an unstable joint. And it is very difficult for the clinicians to make the differentiation between Morton's neuroma and plantar plate tear, even intermetatarsal bursitis or stress fractures. All these differential diagnoses can present themselves very similar. Also keep in mind that plantar plate tears are most commonly degenerative in nature and not necessarily traumatic. Let's go back to the last patient here. The good thing about the lesser metatarsal joints is that you have more than one so you can use the other one as reference and in this case if we go to the fourth lesser metatarsophalangeal joint again this is the normal plate i have shown you this before and if we now go to the fifth you can immediately see first of all the position of the base here it's dorsally subluxated and you have a wide gap here between the plantar plate, shown here, and the base. So it's clearly more than 2.5 millimeters. And even if we go to the lateral side, you don't have this smooth black structure. It's all fuzzy and dirty and gray on both sides. So this clearly is a plantar plate tear of the fifth metatarsophalangeal joint with dorsal subluxation of this joint because it's now unstable. Let's have a look at the same joint in the axial view. Again, you can use the fourth or any of the others as a reference. You have this U-shaped form here with the plantar plate and the accessory collateral ligaments here. Now, if we go to this joint, you can somehow appreciate the plantar plate here, but then here is fluid intensity where the accessory collateral ligament should be. So this is a plantar plate tear here at this location. Note that most of the plantar plate tears actually occur at the lateral portion of this U-form and this is basically because you have most of the forces during walking or uh, using high heels at this location because all these metatarsal heads they are slightly tilted to the lateral side so the force is impacting here on the lateral portions of the plantar plate complex and that's why most tears occur at this location, nicely visible here in this patient. This is another patient, this is the hallux, and if we go to the second metatarsophalangeal joint here, you can nicely see the plantar plate here. We have this recess, a little bit fluid filled, and you don't see the proximal attachment very well. Here at the base of the proximal phalanx, it is nicely attaching, we don't have a mid-sagittal cleft, and if we go laterally or medially, it's really nicely attaching here into the base. So this is an intact plantar plate. Now if we go to the third metatarsophalangeal joint, immediately you can see the plantar plate is torn. It has to be torn if you have this luxation or dislocation of the metatarsophalangeal joint. Now again, this is an easy case. You have the plantar plate somewhat curled up here and we have a large gap here, it's completely torn and we have this dislocation. So this is an easy case, obviously. Let me show you this case also in the axial views. Again, you have 
the second metatarsal phalangeal joint. We have a nice U-shaped black structure here. Really nice. And then the third one, you can see the plate here and you don't have a nice U. You have bits here and there, but keep in mind that you have still the flexor tendons here coming this way. And also the flexor tendon is kindly subluxated as well. This might be an indirect sign of a plantar plate here as well. So this is an easy case. This is a new patient and first let's start with our sagittal view. Again, this is the hallux, not going into this here, and then this is the second metatarsophalangeal joint. So you can appreciate the plantar plate here. There is some fuzziness here at the mid-sagittal view here. And if we go medially, it's attaching nicely here onto the base. And if we go laterally, you don't really have this black structure going through here. It's not so easy to see here on these sagittal views. Let's go to the third metatarsophalangeal joint for comparison. Here we have the mid-sagittal cleft. This is the plantar plate of the third metatarsophalangeal joint. If we go medially, you have a nice black structure inserting onto the base. If we go laterally again, it seems to be a black structure running through. Now let's go back to the second metatarsophalangeal joint. Here. Medially is fine. And then laterally we have this tear here of the plantar plate. So this is a lateral tear of the plantar plate and you can easily appreciate this on the axials. I would say it's easier to see plantar plate tears on your axials because you can look for the black U-shaped structure here. This one is okay on the third metatarsophalangeal joint. And if you have a look at the second metatarsophalangeal joint, uh, there are a few signal changes here already and you don't have this running through. So here is a tear on the lateral side, as I said earlier, which is more frequently affected. And it's nicely visible here that you have here a plantar plate tear. If you look at your coronals here, you can also appreciate that there is a shift of the base onto the head here. So it's the toe is not in the anatomic position because there is some instability and malposition here. On this same patient, if you only look at your axial T1 sequence shown here, you might think that there is a little bit too much of tissue here and you can easily mistake this as a Morton's neuroma. And this is a very common mistake that people make. What you can have here if you have a plantar plate tear is a so-called pericapsular fibrosis. And this pericapsular fibrosis might actually look like a Morton's neuroma if you only have your T1 sequence. However, in contrast to the Morton's neuroma, it's more eccentric and not really in the middle of the intermetatarsal space. Now, yet another patient, you can see this mid cleft, which is considered to be normal. We have the plantar plate, the proximal insertion, not really nicely attaching, which is perfectly normal. And we have this recess here. If we go medially, you have black structures attaching onto the base. So the second one seems to be okay. Now, the third one, we already have quite some signal changes here. This is medially where it's looking normal. And if we go laterally, it's really not nice and smooth. So it's hard to depict on your sagittals. So always make sure you pick your axials because it's mo so much easier here. And you can see, go to the level of the metatarsal head. You have the second one, which is more or less normal. You have this U-shaped structure here. And if you look at the third one, again here, the accessory collateral ligament is not black and nicely and smoothly running upwards. You have the plate, the medial one is okay and it's too bright so you have a plantar plate tear laterally here on this third intermetatarsal of a lingual joint. If you look at the T1 sagittal you can also appreciate that it's very fuzzy and dirty and it can easily be mistaken for a Morton's neuroma. Again, do not make this mistake because this is some pericapsular fibrosis. Let's have a look at yet another example. Again, we start off with the greater toe for reference and you can immediately see that the base of the proximal phalanx of this second metatarsophalangeal joint is dorsally subluxated, which is suggestive of a plantar plate tear already by itself. The tear itself is not easy to see on the sagittal here, so let's switch straight to our uh, axials. And 
for reference, have a look at the third meta Tars of Alangle joint where you have this nice ooh. Now go to the second one and immediately you can see something is going on here. There is not a nice black structure running around. We have a subluxation or luxation or displacement of the flexor tendons laterally here, which is also a sign of a plantar plate tear. There are parts of the accessory collateral and proper collateral ligaments that are signal changed and scarred probably and the plantar plate is completely torn here. So this is again an extensive plantar plate tear. Now this is after gadolinium administration and it seems to be so much easier to see these plantar plate tears after gadolinium and there are studies that even say that around 30% of all plantar plate tears are only visible after gadolinium administration. So if the referring physician is asking you for a plantar plate tear, you should probably consider giving a gadolinium intravenously. Now in this case it wouldn't um, help us that much because we have already seen the plantar plate on the other sequences. But again this is the normal plate and here it's strongly enhancing and we don't have this black U-shaped structure here. And this is yet another patient. This time we are at the level of the second metatarsal of phalangeal joint. And if I scroll to the third one, you can nicely see the plantar plate inserting onto the base, medially and laterally. And if you go to the second one, you can see that we have a large gap here. And it's clearly more than 2.5 millimeters. And the plate seems to be even retracted up to here. So already here on this sagittal view, we have a plantar plate tear. And if we look at the axials, again, look for one of your other joints for reference. You have this U-shaped structure here. And here we have this large gap in the plantar plate. This is the accessory collateral ligament. This is the middle portion of the plantar plate and there is a tear. And even the lateral accessory collateral ligament is not nicely visible here. Also on this uh, not fat saturated image, you can nicely see that we don't have this black plate here, but we have some scarring going on and signal changes of the plate and also of the accessory collateral ligament. Now, if you look at this structure here, and that's a very important point I'd like to make, this is not a Morton's neuroma. Be very careful not to call any structure or every structure you see in the intermetatarsal space automatically a Morton's neuroma, especially if you have a concomitant plantar plate tear. This is a pericapsular fibrosis, which occurs because you have this plantar plate tear. And if you have this pericapsular fibrosis alone, the odds ratio of having a plantar plate tear is over 100. I mean, I have never seen a odds ratio that high, but if you see a pericapsular fibrosis here, it's very, very likely that the plantar plate is torn. Sometimes this is also referred to as a pseudoneuroma, and the differentiation between these pseudoneuromas or pericapsular fibrosis versus a real Morton's neuroma is that this fibrosis is more eccentric. So the, let me show you this here. The Morton's neuroma would be more centrally located in the intermetatarsal space. And this mass is slightly shifted to the medial side. So it's eccentric and it's most likely reflecting this pericapsular fibrosis. This is a very good sign to make a plantar plate tear diagnosis or increase your confidence in a tear. Now, there are also studies that say if you have a mass in the, in the second intermetatarsal space, it's more likely fibrosis in conjunction with a plantar plate tear. And if you have a mass in the third intermetatarsal space, it's more likely to be a real Morton's neuroma. However, this is still debatable and it, it was mentioned in one study that it's an additional uh, point you can make in differentiating Morton's neuroma from pericapsular fibrosis. So this is the last patient that I'm going to show you today. And you can see that we have the plantar plates here of the third metatarsophalangeal joint on the T2, nice black U-shaped structure, probably okay. We have some fluid in the intermetatarsal bursa here. And now focus on the second metatarsal phalangeal joint. You can see that this U, our U structure is not really black anymore, even on the T1, but also on the T2, it's thick, 
it's thicker than normal, it's un ill defined, and we have this mess here. You can see here also on T1. And this was misdiagnosed as a Morton's neuroma. But if you look closely, it's slightly eccentric. It's more on the medial side than really in the middle of the intermetatarsal space. We have some real ill-defined accessory collateral ligaments here. This is the same case after gadolinium administration and you can see there is enhancement here first of all in the intermetatarsal space and bursa so clearly we have intermetatarsal bursitis. We have the plantar plate here and if we scroll through you can appreciate that we have a tear here laterally on the plantar plate and I would argue that this is a pericapsular fibrosis in conjunction with a plantar plate here of the second metatarsophalangeal joint. In the literature there is a grading system that you could theoretically use um, to describe these plantar plate tears and it's, it's a little bit confusing and honestly I wouldn't use it at all but try to make the distinction between lateral tears and medial tears and that's about it. You don't really have to make a differentiation between longitudinal or horizontal tears or any combination of that because I think it's not really feasible in daily practice anyways. Also there are a few studies that tried MR arthrography for the diagnosis of plantar plate tears but why would you do that? I mean seriously? Let's quickly recap. First remember the U-shape of the anatomy of the plantar plate of the lesser metatars of langer joints. Then realize the mid-sagittal cleft or recess is a normal finding up to 2.5 millimeters. Have the pericapsular fibrosis in mind as an indirect sign of a plantar plate tear and also as a differential diagnosis to Morton's neuroma. Plantar plate tears are more likely on the lateral side of the plantar plate and around one third of all plantar plate tears are only visible after gadolinium administration. All the studies that I use to make this presentation are down in the description. I would like to thank my patrons over on my Patreon page, although there are only two, but uh, I really appreciate it and this video was actually suggested by one of them. So if you want to know more about Patreon and if you want to become a patron of this channel, check the link down in the description or if you have any question uh, regarding this, you can also comment below and I will come back to you. Okay, that's all for today folks. I hope you learned something and hopefully the next case with a plantar plate tear you will manage with ease. And let me know in the comments below if you think the video was too long because I'm not sure if a 20 minute video is actually what you guys are looking for and I certainly try to keep my videos short. And also hit that like button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and also hit the bell button and then you get automatically notified every time I upload a new video. My voice is still intact. Yeah, I made it. Very good.